Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath and for the rest that you promised to give us in Christ. We ask that we can take his yoke upon us and that we can learn of him. We know, Lord, that we have much to learn, much to see in ourselves, but mostly to see in Christ, that we can be changed into the same image. We pray for each person studying and uh, for this movement and for the light that you've given us. And we ask, Lord, that we can be faithful, that we can walk in the light that's before us, and that as we look at the past, we can understand the present and the future. Be with us now, we ask for your spirit to touch our hearts and our minds. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good evening. Happy Sabbath. Um, the study today is going to be a little bit in-depth. Uh, I'm going to try to do the best that I can to explain a number of things um, for us to understand the significance of 666 on the 1850 chart. And, and this is something that I've, you know, I've struggled with for a long time, and we looked at it a bit last week. So we know that the 666 on the 1843 chart is there, though it's not, it's more implied uh, than, than stated. That is, when Miller puts uh, 158, the league, um, he's understanding that there's going to be 666 years to 508. And, and we looked at that a little bit yesterday in his writings and some other writings. And, and the reasoning behind it is fairly solid. Now, we also know that 666 after 1844 on the 1850 chart is going to have um, another take on it. That is, they're going to talk about the number being made up, similar to what we have with the 144,000. So they're going to have this number 666. Their name's number 666. And in the writings, people like um, Jay and Andrews and others are going to talk about this number being made up, that there's this number made up. And Ellen White talks about it. Uh, this number being made up, and in brackets, it says 666. So, so we looked at those things. And what we want to try to do is understand the significance of why Miller is correct when he talks about this 666 years, and why the 1850 chart is also correct in its addressing of the 666. What we, what they what we see now, though, is there's significance that they could not have seen. And that is we've been given an increase of light, and this increase of light has to do with the prophetic periods. And the significance of 666, um, as it relates to um, all these different things that we've been studying. It relates to Ezekiel, because Ezekiel is going to deal with 666 years, a period of time. He's going to predict the destruction of Jerusalem in the 666 year of Jehoiachin's captivity. He's not going to state it as such, but it's going to be implied. And this number 666, where it comes from, and, and that it has many different applications. Now, we, we studied in one of the earlier studies, uh, Ralph Meyer's understanding of 666, as far as the names of the popes. And when I had talked to him originally about this, um, so over a year ago, maybe about a year ago, he was very dismissive because he said, I have understand what 666 is, and any other interpretation of 666 is wrong. And, and I tried to say to him, well, there's more than one understanding of 666. It has many different applications. And you shouldn't just dismiss other views because they actually enhance what you're, you're studying. But he wouldn't listen to me. He, he was just kind of fed up with people who criticized his study on 
the names of the popes, adding up to 666. So, but my view is that we can make these different applications and that we have one on the 1843 chart and one on the 1850 chart that don't appear to be in agreement, but we would have to assume based upon how God has given us these charts that they must be in agreement and we must understand how they're in agreement. Any thoughts on that at this point? Any questions or comments? Well, this situation with 666, can we draw an example of that? Like the different 70 year periods that we've talked about? Yes. So, so we're going to look at periods of years, but we also know that 70 has different, that, that it's a symbol and that it can be used in different ways. It can be used in the periods of days symbolically from the first day of the fifth month to the 10th day of the seventh month. Um, we can also look at 70 AD itself when the temple is destroyed, Jerusalem's destroyed in 70 AD. And, and many Adventists would actually accept it as a symbol of, of a period of probation. That is 70 years captivity, the 70 AD, we would, we would accept it. So there's no reason that we should just say, well, I'm going to look for the, the only true application of 666 and ignore all others. Um, now, Angela, are you trying to say something? Because you keep lighting up. Okay, so you just, um, you must just have your mic on. So when you make a little bit of noise, it, it you're not noisy though, so you're quiet, so that's nice. Sometimes people have their mics on and it's kind of noisy, but. Okay, now what we're gonna look at here first is is a bit of a review on how I came to recognize the 666 years from the captivity of Jehoiachin in 597 BC to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So initially, uh, I didn't know what this meant. All I knew is that there was this period of time, I'd figured this out, that there was 666 years. And then I noticed that there was 36 years that uh, Jehoiachin was in captivity. That is, he was taken captive on the, the second day of the 12th month in 597 BC, and he was released on the 25th day of the 12th month in 561 BC. So basically, it's 36 years and um, 23 days later that he's released from prison. So he's taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, and then when Nebuchadnezzar dies, um, and, and Jewish tradition it has that Jehoiachin became friends uh, with um, evil Merodach. And evil Merodach, uh, he's going to release him from prison in um, when he ascends to the throne. So he's going to have probably some kind of celebration in connection with his um, coronation that's going to happen on the first day of the first month in 561 BC. <clears throat> Now the 36 years, 36 is a symbol of 666, because if we add one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six, all the way up to plus 36, it adds up to 666. Now why, and does anybody know why, the Babylonians considered 36 important? Besides the fact that it adds up to 666, and why they think 666 is important. Does anybody know? Anybody recall? Did that have something to do with their, their primary god, the, um, the god of sin? Okay, no. Um, how many constellations are there? I was going to say 36. Yeah, there's 36 constellations. So now we know there's 12 signs of the zodiac. Um, and there's for every um, sign sign of the zodiac, there's going to be every constellation that makes those signs of the zodiac. There's going to be uh, 
two more. So altogether, there's going to be 36 constellations. So, so they have this number of basically the number of the gods, so to speak, in the sky. Um, the zodiac ones are the most important because that's where you have uh, the ecliptic, right? So that's where the sun and the moon and the planets uh, travel. So they travel through these 12 constellations. Um, and they divide, of course, the sky into 36 degrees um, or, or 36, what the, the Romans call them decans, but the same idea. So there's 36 uh, sections that they can divide the horizon into um, with 10 degrees each. And so there's 360 degrees in a circle because of how they divide the sky. And this is just their way of measuring what's happening in the sky as part of their astrology. So, so the symbol here is that Babylon is going to take Jehoiachin captive in fulfillment of Leviticus 26. So in Leviticus 26, the third seven times is the one where we can mark Jehoiachin being taken captive. The fourth seven times is going to be Zedekiah's captivity and the destruction of Jerusalem and, and the captivity and all the things attached to that. And then in Deuteronomy 28, we're going to have the siege of Jerusalem by Rome. So the siege of Jerusalem by Rome uh, is tying Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 together with a period of 666 years. And we know there's 36 years at the end. That is, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed 36 years after the close of Jewish probation. So to me, this is pretty profound. Um, I was first presented to this movement back in uh, 2014 that I presented this in Arkansas at the, the fall camp meeting. So that was in October of 2014. But nobody really picked up on this. I mean, some people say, oh, that's kind of interesting. But we really didn't know what to do with it. We didn't know what it meant other than that we could look back at the prophecies and we could see that there was these connections. Now, later, when we started to understand Ezekiel more, we started to understand that there's a much greater significance in this, in that Ezekiel is making a prediction about the destruction of Jerusalem in 592. Actually, I should look at one of these other diagrams has that in there. Um, so in this one, you can see I have Ezekiel's vision in 592. So the idea is that Ezekiel is going to be making a prediction about the destruction of Jerusalem in his time. But he's marking things in 592. He talks about in the fifth year of Jehoiachin's captivity. So if you take 592 as the fifth year, 70 AD is the 666th year of Jehoiachin's captivity. And he's going to talk about his release that's going to happen here after 36 years. Um, so, so there's this prediction that Ezekiel's making, but he's making another prediction as well, unbeknownst to him, that I don't think he recognizes that Jerusalem's going to be destroyed a second time and that his count that he has for Jehoiachin's captivity is going to be fulfilled in a period of 666 years the second time. Um, so the 36 years at the beginning and at the ending are both a symbol of the period of the 666 years. So back in 2014, when I noticed this, I started to notice that prophetic periods tend to have a period at the beginning at the end, and the end that are tied to the longer period that they uh, they begin and end, right? So they begin and end a period with these other periods, and they're significant. They're not just happenstance. So God's giving us an understanding here. Now, this is this chart I made back in 2014. It's a little, maybe 2015, maybe after the camp meeting. Um, now, what I have here, it's a little bit hard to look at, but I have the 1260 years from 723 BC 
to 538. So this is the first half of the 2520 for Northern Israel. So this is the period of paganism. And I'm going to note that there's 126 years from 723 BC to 597. So you can see that this period at the beginning is one tenth of this entire period. So that makes sense to people, hopefully. That it, you know, that it's not, that there's, that this period of 666 years that begins in 597 BC is tied to this structure that also includes um, other prophecies or other prophetic lines. Now you can see the next date on the bottom is 158 BC. Hopefully people can see this and it's big enough. I'm going to just try to make it a little bigger. Well, not that much bigger. And it's really jumping. So maybe this will work. Is that better for people? It is yeah. larger. I can see it. Okay. Now, so 158 BC is an inclusive count going to 508. That is, Miller argued that this is the remaining time for pagan Rome uh, from this um, league. So we know that modern scholarship argues the league was in 161. But based on his argument, he's actually not looking at when the league is initially made, but really when it's put into effect. And that's going to be 158 BC. And so he's going to count this 666 years that he counts cardinally, except that he doesn't recognize there's no zero year. But we can still take it as a period of 666 years. That's not a problem. So 508 AD, that's the taking away of the daily. And we can see that that is how he understood this period of time. Now, Judean independence occurred in 129 BC. Now, most of us don't know about this, but it's, it's a well-established date. You can look it up in Wikipedia. And from that date, you're going to have 666 years, cardinal years, to 538. So we can see that there's three periods here of 666 years, and they're connected thematically. That is, one ends in 508, one ends in 538, and that's perfectly sound. One's dealing with the league that the Jews makes with the Romans. The other one starts with this time of Judean independence. Now, you'll also see from 70 AD to 538 is 468 years. So this is a period of 504 years from 34 AD to 538. And so this is understood as being 2 times 252 when you put it together, right? So we already understand this. Now you'll see there's also from 597 BC to 129 BC, a period of 468 years. Of course, that's going to be logical based upon Miller's, um, wait, from, I guess from this one here, 666, and this one here, 666, you're, you're obviously going to have this matching at the beginning and the end. But this 468 years is an important period of time. It's uh, seven times 36, I believe, is it? Um, no, it's 13 times 36. And, and that comes from uh, the 49 years at the beginning of the 70 weeks, where you have 13 years and 36 years, because 13 years brings you to 444. 444 BC is when Nehemiah occurs. And that 13 times 36 equals uh, 468, if I remember correctly. It's 14 times 36 is 504. So, um, now we also see in here this period from 37 BC. Anybody knows what happens in 37 BC?
Doesn't that <clears throat> involve Herod's family becoming the rulers in, in uh, well, well, it's more significant than that in the context of what we're looking at, um, because we're dealing with um, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And in 37 AD, you have the siege of Jerusalem under uh, um, it's Her Herod's great siege of Jerusalem, it's called. So we don't often we just don't recognize there's other sieges of Jerusalem. So in 37 BC, you have this siege of Jerusalem by Herod. And and that's going to be significant because we already have a 70 AD in there. Now, notice that it's 70 years to the close of probation in 34 AD. And then 36 years and then you're going to have in 70 AD the destruction of Jerusalem. So this is this 37 BC date is connected chronologically with what happens later. Does that make sense to people? You're making a good case. Yes. Okay. And then, uh, you know, we can see there's 162 years from Judean independence to their close of probation in 34 AD. And 162 is, you know, an iteration, I guess, of 126. It's kind of in the middle of all of this. Um, so, you know, there's definitely some things that could be looked at and understood uh, about that. But it's just to me, it seemed like the fact that there was 70 years there and then the 92 adding to 162. That's why I put it there. I could have left it out because it's not as significant, but it's still some of the things that we see. Now, we also, of course, have the siege of Jerusalem in 66 AD, and that's going to be the siege with um, uh, Cestius. Is that the name? Yeah, Cestius. Okay. So, so I thought that just the fact that it's 66 AD and we have all these 666s, you, you can see again that that number is significant. So I think I addressed all the numbers here. Oh, oh the 1134. So, well, you can see just 1260, if you take off 126, that is you're taking off 1 10th, nine times 126 is 1134. But that, so I have up here some calculations uh, that I did a long time ago. I don't know if I remember what they're all about. I just did some things. I took the 129, so that's 129 BC plus 538. So that's going to be adding these dates together to show that they're 666 years. Uh, so I add them and the subtract one because of there's the fact there's no zero year, but there is zero in the math. And then I do the same thing. I take 129. I just do the math. It shows it's 162. And then I take, uh, this is interesting, where I take a 597 plus 538, and I show again, that's the 1134. But then I show that 162 times 7 also equals 1134. So this period here, this 162 years from 597 to 538 is um one seventh of this period so the fact that it's one seventh of this period that i'm counting is quite interesting so there's there's no reason that that should be so this 162 though is is tying those together so that's one of the reasons i put it there as well and then i take of course 723 minus 597 that's going to give me that 126 years and then I show that 126 times 9 is 1134, because that's obviously 126 times 10 is 1260. And then 1260 minus 1134 equals 126. So I'm just showing that again in another way in the math. Um, and then I'm going to show that 13 times 36 equals 468. So some of those things that I talked about earlier. So that was just kind of an analysis of 
of these things. Okay, now. Um, Sorry to interrupt, but would you go back yeah. to the first chart that you were showing? The first chart. Okay. Um, you're talking about the one with Jehoiachin, 666 years? Right. So this one? Right. Okay. Did something odd because, you know, we have 25, a 2520 with something that divides it and we have a 2520 that is divided into parts but not perfectly divided right okay so looking at this taking this 666 year period mm -hmm. <clears throat> have you seen anything intriguing about the midpoint of this 666 year period? Uh, well, I never thought about it. Okay. Well, if we, do, if we do the simple math, the midpoint should be about 264 BC. Oh, okay. All right. So that's going to be, well, if we take, because um, half of 666 is 333. So if I go um, 597 minus 333, yeah, 264, yeah, which is an important symbol, the 26th day of the fourth month. Okay, now, yeah, looking at this, and I, I present this, you know, just because this is the way my odd mind works. Okay. Okay, we have... 264 BC. Yeah. But that can be expressed in another way, as in the year from which the city was founded, or as, as some would say, ab urbe condata. Okay. Yeah, talking about Rome. Right. Yeah. That year was the 490th year from the founding of Rome. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> now, and, and the significance of these, so the 264, so one of the things about Ezekiel, because Ezekiel is where I get this 666 years, and Ezekiel gives us July 18th, but the symbol there is the 10th day of the fifth month. So it, in 2020, it was July 31st, 13 days after July 18th, which was the 26th day of the fourth month. But here you can see that this 666 also produces that same symbol that we get in um, Josiah Lich's prophecy. So that's okay. significant. But also tying the 490 into it, um, because you can see that the 70 weeks are part of this. I agree. Yeah, they're but part of the structure. Yeah. Here, here was, the, here was the, the, the point that really smacked me upside the head. That year, the 490th year since the city had been founded or the 26th day of the fourth month, as we were just addressing, mm -hmm. represents the first time a Roman army had gone into action outside of the Italian peninsula. Oh, okay. What was, what was the battle? It, it was the Roman council... Appius Claudius Caudax and his two legions were deployed to Sicily. Okay. So we have two legions going from the north to the south. So he led his forces to Messina, and as the Mountains have convinced the Carthaginians to withdraw, he meets with, his, with only minimal resistance. The city is handed over to Appius Claudius Caudex, but the Carthaginians return to set up a blockade. So Carthage. Right. Yeah, okay. So there, there, there's actually quite a bit that went on there, but this being the first time 
that Roman legions were employed outside of the Italian peninsula is, I would think, a symbol of the power that Rome would look to begin exercising within just a few years. Okay. Yeah. Now, I know, you know, people watching these videos, like, so, you know, here Dwight brings up something which I think is extremely profound. Um, not everybody would be familiar with all of these symbols, but some of us would be. Um, but this is something we didn't notice before. At least I never noticed it before, the 264, which becomes extremely important in the context of what is being unfolded to this movement at the present time. That is, what we've come to understand in our studies is that we still have more light to be given to us. That is, God gave us light, and he gave us this light for a purpose. It was to test us. He wants to enter into a covenant with us, but he still wants to continue giving us light, and that this light is based upon what he's revealed in the past. And it's difficult for many because not everyone is really interested in the light that's coming. That is, there is light supposed light that's coming to this movement, which undermines uh, all of the light that God has given us in the past, even though people aren't always aware of how it's doing that. That is, there's, um, and, and it's hard for me to sort of point out to people exactly how that happens. And that's why we're going through this study. We're going to see what light God is giving us and why this is significant and that we, it's important for us to accept this light. What Dwight just showed us is very, very important. It's not something that, you know, it's just a, a novelty. You know, it's kind of well, an interesting little detail. It's telling us things, okay? So, now we, we know that all of these things are a type of the end of the world. Right? right. That's, why, that's why we're looking at these things in the past. Right. These aren't just dead facts. This isn't just something from yesterday's almanac. This is something that um, we need to pay attention to. OK. Now, as far as 666, we know that um, the views that are going to develop in Adventism have to do with the Pope's title, Vicarious Filei Dei, right? The Vicar of the Son of God. And if we take the Roman letters that are Roman numerals in that title and we add them up, they come to 666. And we're all aware of that. Now, there's been a controversy within Adventism uh, where people claim that the mitre never existed. Now, where does the title first show up? Does anybody know? Where that title came from. Did it come from Babylon? Okay, well, it didn't come from Babylon because it's a Roman title. Um, a Roman. Okay. Right. okay, so this title is um, from a forged document called the Donation of Constantine. So that's where it comes from. And what's the significance of that, that it comes from a forged document? Is there any significance in that? The fact that it's a fake document. Okay, it's a fake document, <laughs> yeah. But does but that's, does that discount the calculation? No. Okay. Why not? That fake document is trying to set Peter up mm -hmm. as being the pontiff. Right. So it's it's all about Peter and Constantine and all these things. That this this title is um, is links them all together. What's that? 
it links Peter with all of those that claim to have followed him. Right. So they're still using that title, even though they they forged this document. It, the title still is the title. Now I know that uh, um, Samuel Bakayoki he was really not a fan of this interpretation. And, you know, he said he searched all over the, the Vatican and never found a tiara with this inscribed on it. Um, but, but we know that, that that's kind of immaterial in this context because the title still exists. So now, if we're going to look at this, we're going to look at the Pope's title. Is this consistent with the 666 years or not? It, are they mutually exclusive or are they complementary? Could you rephrase that, please? So. We have the 666 year periods, we have three of them. And now we have this title of the Pope. Are, are they mutually exclusive? Like, could we say, well, we have to choose one or the other, or can we say that they complement each other? I would have to say they complement each other. Okay. And, and we can see that when we understand the 666 years, what they're doing, they're first giving passing something from Babylon, which is a symbol of sun worship, right? And, and, and sky worship, astrology. The sun, of course, is the most powerful deity uh, in the heavens. And, and we have um, these, these other 666 year periods, the one that Miller found, which is dealing with uh, pagan Rome and its period. And then this other 666 year period that I found going from the Judean independence to 538 that deals with the setting up of the papacy in 538. So the fact that the papacy is, has this title that has this number 666 complements or supports the arguments for the time periods. Now we're going to look at the Bible verses itself. Um, so we're going to go to Revelation chapter 13 and look at this a bit more. So this second beast, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. He exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So that's going to be the first beast up here, Revelation 13, verse 1, the one that comes out of the sea. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles, which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship, the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 603 score and six. So we're all very familiar with these verses. Now, when we look at how we've, how the pioneers had understood this, they obviously initially did not understand this as having to do with the Sunday law. They were, they were Sunday keepers prior to, for the most part, prior to October 22nd, 1844. 
<clears throat> so in the Millerite movement, um, they didn't have a way to, to tie this to the Sunday law, but they did see that there was some kind of image to the beast that would rise. And the Millerites come to understand this after 1844, the early Adventists, as this, this is regarding the United States. Now, I want to look at a statement in the spirit of prophecy. And uh, I just need to go here. Now, this statement, um, somebody else had put it on uh, WhatsApp. Um, but it's uh, Spirit of Prophecy, page 277. And I'll get it so you can see it. Okay. Okay, I know I, got, I didn't share it properly. It's not showing up. I don't know what's happening here. There we go. I just didn't click properly. Okay, it should show up. There it goes. So Ellen White says, um, now I'm going to go back and read a little bit here. So one thing that we'll see is that Ellen White is supporting the idea of the two desolating powers. So we should keep that in mind. Okay. She says, through the great powers controlled by paganism and the papacy, symbolized by the dragon and the leopard-like beast, Satan for many centuries destroyed God's faithful witnesses. Under the dominion of Rome, they were tortured and slain for more than a thousand years. But the papacy was at last deprived of its strength and forced to desist from persecution. At that time, the prophet beheld a new power coming up, represented by the beast with lamb-like horns. The appearance of this beast and the manner of its rise seem to indicate that the power which it represents is unlike those brought to view under the preceding symbols. The great kingdoms that have ruled the world obtained their dominion by conquest and revolution. And they were presented to the prophet Daniel as beasts of prey, rising when the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea, Daniel 7, 2. But the beasts, beast with horns like a lamb is seen coming up out of the earth, Revelation 13, 11, signifying that instead of overthrowing other powers to establish itself, the nation thus represented arose in territory previously unoccupied, and grew up gradually and peaceably, peacefully. Here is a striking figure of the rise and growth of our own nation, and the lamb-like horns, emblems of innocence and gentleness, well represent the character of our government, as expressed in its two fundamental principles, republicanism and protestantism. Now, what are the two principles, the two fundamental principles of the United States? Republicanism and Protestantism. Remember when Parminder was teaching that the United, the United States is not a Christian nation? Very well. Yeah, which is crazy, of course, and a direct contradiction of the spirit of prophecy. And we know just a direct contradiction of history because the whole principle that the Constitution was based upon were Christian principles. The separation of church and state was a Christian principle. The Christian exiles who first fled to America sought an asylum from royal oppression and priestly intolerance, and they determined to establish a government upon the broad foundation of civil and religious liberty. These principles are the secret of our power and prosperity as a nation. Millions from other lands have sought our shores, and the United States has risen to a place among the most powerful nations of the earth. But the stern tracings of prophetic 
of the prophetic pencil reveal a change in this peaceful scene. The beast with lamb-like horns speaks with the voice of a dragon and exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. The spirit of persecution manifested by paganism and the papacy is again to be revealed. Prophecy declares that this power will say to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. The image is made to the first or leopard-like beast, which is the one brought to view in the third angel's message. So when it talks about the third angel worship the beast in his image, that's re referencing this, of course. Um, uh, so in Revelation 14 here, I'm just going to go, I'm just going to see what um, Revelation 14. It, yeah, what the words are there, it says, um, yeah, it talks about this. Uh, who worship the beast and his image. So they have no rest day or nor night who worship the beast and his image. So that's referencing chapter 13. And <clears throat> by this first beast is represented the Roman church, an ecclesiastical body clothed with civil power, having authority to punish all dissenters. The image to the beast represents another religious body clothed with similar power. The formation of this image is the work of that beast whose peaceful rise and mild professions render it so striking a symbol of the United States. Here is to be found an image to the papacy. When the churches of our land uniting upon such points of faith as are held by them in common, ecumenism, right, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and sustain their institutions, then will Protestant America have formed an image to the Ro Roman hierarchy. Then the true church will be assailed by persecution, as were God's ancient people. Almost every century furnishes examples of what bigotry and malice can do under a plea of serving God by protecting the rights of church and state. Protestant churches that have followed in the steps of Rome by forming alliance with worldly powers have manifested a similar desire to restrict liberty of conscience. In the 17th century, thousands of nonconformist ministers suffered under the rule of the Church of England. Persecution always follows religious favoritism on the part of secular governments. The beast with lamb-like horns commands all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. This is the mark concerning which the third angel utters his warning. It is the mark of the first beast or the papacy and is therefore to be sought among the distinguishing characteristics of that power. The prophet Daniel declared that the Roman church symbolized by the little horn was to think to change times and laws, while Paul styled it the man of sin. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. He who was to exalt himself above God, only by changing God's law could, be the, papacy, could the papacy exalt itself above God. Um, yeah, who was to, okay, only by changing God's law could the papacy exalt itself above God. Who, whoever should understandingly keep the law as thus changed would be giving supreme honor to that power by which the change was made. Such an act of obedience to papal laws would be a mark of allegiance to the Pope in the place of God. The papacy has attempted to change the law of God. The second commandment forbidding image worship has been dropped from the law and the fourth commandment has been so changed as to authorize the observance of the first instead of the seventh day as the Sabbath. The papists urge as a reason for omitting the second commandment that it is unnecessary being included in the first and that they are giving the law exactly as God designed it to be understood. This cannot be the change foretold by the prophet. An intentional deliberate change is brought to view. He shall think to change times and laws. 
The change in the fourth commandment exactly fulfills the prophecy. For this change, the only authority claimed is that of the church. Here, the papal power openly sets itself above God. So, of course, we're familiar with all of this. Now, when we go back to the statement, this, especially this paragraph here. So one of the things we see is that this is talking about these two desolating powers, right? That's how it sort of begins through the great powers controlled by paganism and the papacy. Um, so we know that pagan Rome first and then papal Rome. So if we're going to look at this, um, <coughs> this beast, this image to the beast, what is it? Okay, let's, let's ask another. Is the United States one of the heads on the beast that comes from the, from the sea, according to the pioneers? Understand what I'm asking? According to the pioneers, yes. No, so the United States can't be one of the heads in, that is, it's, it's not, I'd be, I'm not asking the question right. So the idea that the heads represent uh, seven um, kingdoms, right? Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, the United States, and then the UN, did the pioneers understand that? Is that how they understood the seven hints? Because they understood the seven heads to be what? Seven forms of government at the end of the world. Okay, so seven forms of Roman government, which we went through that study before. So the United States is not part of that beast that comes from the sea, that is, it's distinct from it. Would we agree with that? Okay, so in other words, it is not of the beast that comes from the sea with the sea representing a multitude of people. Right. It is a beast that comes up from the land or comes from an area that had priorly been uninhabited. Yeah. Now it's going to make an image to the beast. And, and that is going to be described in Revelation 17 in a bit more detail to understand what that means. So here it's going to give us a, and we have two different puzzles that are given. Uh, in Revelation 13, we are said, we are, uh, it's said, so I'm just going to go to the Bible here because uh, I got to switch back there. Sorry about that. Um, so in Revelation 13, it's going to say, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. And we're going to have a similar type of idea um, in, in Revelation 17. Um, here's the mind that hath wisdom, 17 verse 9. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So we're going to have these two places in Revelation where it's going to say that we need wisdom. Now, why does it tell us we need wisdom? Is it possible it's because what's apparent or what we might think is apparent may not be the right answer? Okay, so there's something here that's hidden that, that God is going to have to reveal to us. That is, we can study God's word, and of course the Holy Spirit always works to, to, to teach us what God's word means. But these that have wisdom 
These are something special. That is, it's not something that's understood at the time. It, it's something that is going to be revealed in the future. As we search in God's word and as events unfold in history. So we know that there are things we can understand about it, but there's things that we don't fully understand. Now, when we're dealing with the wisdom here, it says, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. Now, why does the beast have a number? Why would we have to count the number of the beast? Based on what it's talking about here, why do we need to count the number of the beast? So we can look back and see that number in the lines, you know, the way marks. Okay, so, so we know that this is tying us to something. So we have this number of the beast. Now, some people will feel, well, it's vicarious, vicarious filet day. It's on the Pope's mitre. It's in the donation of Constantine. It's the title of the Pope. And that's the number of the beast. And all I need to know is that uh, the Pope is the Antichrist and his number is 603 score and six. Of course, people will try to look at this number that's something literal, uh, some kind of mark that we're going to get. Maybe it's a UPC code or something like that. All kinds of different ideas. Uh, maybe it's the vaccine has somehow 666 encoded in it, right? So people try all these different things to, to understand this, but we know that this is a symbol. And that this symbol has been understood by the Millerites in the past and early Adventists had an understanding of this symbol. But that understanding was incomplete, but it was still an understanding. Now, Ellen White, when she talks about this, she doesn't talk about this part of it. She doesn't talk about the 666 here, other than in her one statement where it's from um, Word to the Little Flock, in that booklet it's published, and we have this number 666. The number was made up, 666. Um, and and whether that's what she means, the 666 is correct or not, we would I would take the view that, that she's probably referring to 666 based upon how it's understood by people around her at the time, that she's not going to give some new meaning to it that, and not explain it to anyone. Um, but they're not making it the, 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 the title of Vicarious Filet Dei back in 1850. Or even earlier when the word to the little flock occurs. So, um, so why does it give us these three things? The mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name? What would be the difference? Is it just repeating the same thing as that his mark is the number of his name and it's also the name of the beast that that you understand what i'm asking so we know there's going to be restriction on buying and selling but um why these three things are mentioned are they three separate things or just a re re reiteration of the same thing I think that's the clues for the wisdom that we need as well. Okay, explain that. I believe that they're separate things and that they can work together because in some time periods they may not be as visible and you may need to look at one or two or three of those in order to, to bring them together so you can understand who this, this power is. Okay, so when we look at the mark of the beast, we would say that that's Sunday. Right? 
Would you agree with that? Mm, that's what we understand, yes. Okay. But the name of the beast is not Sunday. Right. Right. So the name of the beast has to do with the character of the beast. Right? Because name denotes character. Indeed. Okay. But then the number of his name. Well, that, in the context here, we know the mark of the beast is Sunday. The name of the beast is this character, the characteristics of this beast, its persecutory power, etc. But now it says, or the number of his name. And the person can't buy or sell unless he has these three things. He has to have the mark, the name of the beast, and also the number of his name. And it doesn't say that he has to know the number of his name. It doesn't say that the number of his name is written on him as a mark. Isn't it also a parallel to the Godhead? Like it's a, do you know what I'm saying? Like it's a, a, a type of Trinity sort of thing, you mean, in that sense, Father? I know in that sense. Okay. It, I don't know. I don't know if I would look at it that way. It's, but it's the, the not healthy Trinity, if you will. I don't know. Maybe it's just my brain. Too. Okay. Well, the thing is, if somebody's going to have the number of his name, that, that means we have to have the number of his name if we're not going to be, if we're going to be able to buy and sell, right? That's what it's saying. What would that mean in the context of what we've talked about 666 years? So what would somebody have if he had the number of his name? Thoughts and actions, characteristics. Okay, but this is a number. So there's a number that's being symbolized here. And that person has to have it if he wants to buy and sell. He just, he's going to have, and if you look back here, right, it says, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. So they're going to receive this mark that no man might buy or sell, say that he had the mark, and then it says, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Now, does that mean that he has to have all three, or just one of those? I think one of those would qualify. Okay. Are these different classes of people? Yeah, I would say the worshiper and the worker, or the secular, secularist. Yeah. And then uh, an open third one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, so the, the word or here would be that either or, right? So the idea here is that he would have to have one of these. It doesn't say um, that no man might buy or sell, save that he has the mark and the name of the beast and the number of his name. He only needs one of them in order to buy or sell. Now, what is this buying and selling about? I mean, we, we take it literally, you know, we're not going to be able to buy or sell. But is that what, how we should understand this primarily? I think it should be more symbolic. Okay, so what would buying or selling refer to in the Bible? Well, do you remember um, we're told that Lucifer was selling his ideas to the angels, mm -hmm. like a merchandise almost. Okay, and, and we're going to see that in Revelation 18, all of this buying and selling, it's going to talk about all these things and, and we can't just take these things as literal. 
because in Revelation 18, it's going to talk about the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore, right? Lists all these different things. And there's all kinds of symbolism in here. And you're not going to have all this here just to describe um, the fact that they can't buy it. You know, they can't sell things anymore. Why list all of these things unless they have symbols attached to them? Right. And especially like if you look here, um, the merchandise of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls and fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet and all the th all thine wool and all manner vessels of ivory, all manner of vessels of most precious wood, of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour, wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. Right. These are this. This is their merchandise. Now, is this about religion or about things? When Babylon is fallen, is it going to be able to sell its message? No. I don't so. We can see a lot of these things are tied to to the sanctuary, to false worship the false sanctuary, the counterfeit. Right, in Revelation 18, verse 16, it says, and saying, alas, alas, woe, woe, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. So what is this referring to? Who's the great city or what's the great city? Wouldn't that bring us back to this woman, right? The woman arrayed in purple, scarlet, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, right? This is Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, abominations of the earth. So if we're going to take these things, they're, they're symbols of religion. Wine is doctrine. Oil, the counterfeit Holy Spirit. Right? Would we agree with that? Anybody have any thoughts about this? Yeah, I agree. Okay, so that no man might buy or sell. So this would be a restriction upon our ability to, to study God's word, right? Or to talk to somebody else about it and have them receive it. Yeah, so this is a type of, of restriction on our religious liberty, not just to practice, but also to preach. And is the issue going to be because we can't, we can't, because they won't let us, or is it because they won't hear it? People have already made up their minds what they're going to believe, and they won't hear it. Yeah, and I think it would probably be a bit of both. No, it's always been some people will not hear. Now, the, still, the question is, what does it mean that somebody has the number of his name? So who's going to be able to buy or sell? What are they going to do when they buy and sell? If they're restricting us from buying and selling, and that has to do with giving the gospel, what is it that they're doing that they're going to be able to do that we can't? In the Hebrew, what is that word number? What does it look like? Are we... In the, in the Greek, mean? in the Greek, yeah. What are we are we thinking of it in the true nature that that it's written in, or are we thinking of it in our own world here? Okay, so the the word number that's going to be used here is the word that we get arithmetic from. So uh, mm. arithmos, arithmos. So, and that means a number as reckoned up. That is, it's something that's counted, right? As it says, counting the number. Is it kind of like 
Hi guys. Cup of gravel in his bowl. Hi guys. Hi. Hi. Hi, Mark. I did come in the front door. I checked my phone. Time. I know it's time for me to sign in. Okay. I I know what Miss Hall have your study. Okay. And could could you please to for me up head you did stopped okay so i'll help you here so we're studying revelation 13 and we're looking at the mark of the beast 666 we're trying to understand it so we've discussed this a little bit and we're trying to understand what it means that somebody um has the mark of the beast the the mark, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And we know that this number is, is where we get the word arithmetic. So it means something that's an actual number and that we have to count. And that word count means to compute, um, to use pebbles in enumeration. That is we're sort of like using, we, in order to understand it, we need like an ab abacus or something like that. So we got to add this up or tally it up in some way. Okay, so that brings me to my point again, mm -hmm. that somehow judgment has fallen upon those who have the mark of the beast, that their sins have added up to, do you know, hear what I'm saying? Like you're kind of subject to the mark to the beast by then? Okay. If that makes sense? Well, see, the thing about the mark of the beast, are people going to know that they have the mark of the beast? I wouldn't think so. Uh, mark of the beast it is Sunday. Yes, correct, Mark. <laughs> Good job, Mark. <laughs> yeah, so the mark of the beast is Sunday. and But are people going to know that they have the mark of the beast? Or are we going to be, be the ones... Is it the one who has wisdom, who is able to discern what the mark of the beast is, what the name of the beast is, and what the number of his name is? And maybe it's understanding the number of his name that actually helps us to understand who the beast is. I'm looking at Ezekiel 28. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. Ezekiel 28, 12 says, Yeah, son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum, because when you said Aristos means the yeah. sum of a like reckoning. Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Yeah. There's a connection it, there, I think. Yes, um, that so was... The attributes of Satan, these people have the attributes of Satan. It's like they perfected it right. by entering into a covenant with yeah. the global, equal, new world order, or whatever you want to call it, Satan's kingdom. Yeah. Well, see, one of the problems that I have um, is that we're Seventh-day Adventists, and we're also people in this movement within Adventism. And, and many people think they know what the mark of the beast is and that they can avoid it. And, and really, to a large degree, the view that Adventists have, even though we have about Sunday and so forth, in a lot of ways, we're copying what the world is doing, what the other churches are doing. That is, we have the same idea that we somehow can just avoid this just because we know what it is but that's not really what the bible is telling us because we know that what's going to be tested is character not knowledge hey mark uh, do you have a comment angela what verse was that ezekiel 28 ezekiel 28 yeah Okay, so uh, 
Chris had a con or was it Jeff? Jeff had a comment. You were going to say was it Chris. I think it was Jeff. Okay, Jeff, you had a comment, Angela. Do you remember what your comment was? This is people that have a mark don't know that. And of course, they don't know they have it. Okay, I didn't really understand what you said, but I can kind of guess. You, you kind of broke up there a little bit. Okay, so, so we know that this is about character. And when you see and this, this here dealing with the lament over the king of Tyre, because the king of Tyre is going to be a type of Satan, right? Um, thou sealest up the sum, uh, this word here, um, add measurement, that is um, a pattern or a sum. And, and this, I think, is important because when we're dealing with what Miller was doing with Revelation 13, is he wasn't concerned about the name of the Pope or his title. He was seeing this as part of a prophetic line. He didn't fully understand what he was doing. He didn't understand how it all fits together. But he could see that this was a period of time and that it wasn't he wasn't looking at the name of the Pope, right? He doesn't take that as, he sort of, again, has this mutually exclusive thing. If I find out what it is, then it discounts all these other things. But we know that it doesn't. That is, the number of his name, Vicarious Phil Day, we can say that's 666. But of course, it has to be more than that. And there are lots of names that we could find and you can add them up to 666. So that can't just be it. There has to be other characteristics. Is, uh, I, I know this, Fedor, is Mark of the Beast is Sunday, seven ways, say, of the names. Okay. Is, so uh, I know one is. I is the seven different ways of the name in the prayer. Okay. If one is the father name of Jesus, that is one. Other ways we speak different ways of we speak different ways of different way prayer of different seven names in the prayer we are okay we speak. so are you talking about gematria taking different names that they have symbols numbers attached to them yes okay yeah yeah so we understand that numbers and names can have symbols at attached to them and so we can take the title of the pope and we can see that that applies but this person has to have the number of his name in order to buy or sell. So that means, I mean, having the number 666 in and of itself, if it was stamped on you, wouldn't cause you to lose your salvation. Yes, I, uh, I say, of, I say the prayer, you're here, here, I want you guys here. Yes, I did. I I said, Father, name of Jesus Christ, Son of God. Yeah. In a different ways. Yeah. And you did say numbers of the name of the in the prayer. Why is first number we will say? Okay. Thanks, Mark. Okay, so when we look at how Miller's looking at this, because he's taking the 666 as years, and some people would say, well, how does he do that? But he starts to understand that the number of his name has to do with this, this power and the period of time that it exists. Now, the thing that's odd here is this talking about this image to the beast, 
right? So Miller doesn't fully understand this image to the beast. And, and we now can recognize that the image to the beast is going to be made by the United States when it brings in Sunday worship and enforces it. So it's going to uh, cause all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, when it says all, and he causeth all, um, we would probably exclude those who <coughs> are following God. That are sealed. Right. right? Yeah, so those that receive the seal of God in contrast to the mark of the beast. So we wouldn't say that all includes every single person. No. Because he's going to cause all or try to cause all that no man might buy or sell. But then we're told that we have to have wisdom. Now, it can't be the way that the evangelicals look at it, you know, that it's some mark, some physical mark on our bodies or on our hands or on our foreheads. It's not something injected into us that gives us the mark of the beast because this is about character. And it can't be done unwittingly. That is, somebody can't just receive the mark and, you know, his soul is lost because he he didn't understand, uh, you know, that some UP, sim, UPC symbol was, you know, had the number 666 in it. And he, you know, he had it tattooed on his wrist or, you know, it was forced on him in some way. Right. So you understand what I'm saying, that this has to say something more. And if we look at what's being talked about in this chapter, so we have chapter 12 as well. We have the pa we have pagan Rome. Now we have the papacy, and now we have the United States. This is a progression. And the United States is taking a role to uh, to put this image of the beast, uh, to create this, and to have this mark of the beast. Now, uh, A. T. Jones wrote a book called The Two Republics. Now, why did he write a book called The Two Republics? What are the two republics? that A.T. Jones was talking about? Anybody know? I presume it's Rome and the U.S. Rome and the U.S. And we can see that Rome uh, and the U.S. are similar. Rome and John and Peter. Yeah. So, so the United States is a republic, like Rome was at one time. And the United States has a lot of the trappings of the Roman government. That is, it's modeled its government in many ways after Rome. The idea of the Constitution, it being a republic, the way it does its buildings, how it names things, you know, the Senate, you know, that's that's a Roman title. You know, then and these things have been passed down from Rome and the United States, in a sense, was seeking to model itself after Rome, but as a Christian nation. So it has horns like a lamb, but it's going to speak as a dragon. And if this, if Miller is correct about these periods of time, these 666 years, and that the other periods of 666 years are also relevant, relevant because they tie in with our understanding of the 2520, uh, the daily, etc., then we would have to say, that it's it's we're understanding the past so that we can understand the present. So to have wisdom here, would that be to understand the past? Is that primarily what's being stated in this term? Here is wisdom. Okay, I can't catch what you're saying. It was kind of broken up, Jeff. I'm just saying it's part of it. Yes. Okay. And then when we go to Revelation 17, and it says, um, here's the mind that has wisdom. So one it says, uh, and, and they're not the same. One says, here is wisdom. And the other one says, here is a mind that has wisdom. So what's the difference? Or are they the same? Uh, 
why are these two chapters giving us this wisdom and what is it telling us? Any ideas? Not everybody will follow wisdom that is out there. Okay. Well, what I'm trying to see is what, 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 how does wisdom, <coughs> these riddles, tie these two chapters together? Are they the same? It is Revelation 13 and Revelation 17 telling us the same story. Well, I would think the last half of 13 and 17 could very well be telling us the same story. Okay. Yeah. And so when it says, when it draws us to this wisdom, we'd have to, we should recognize then that it's these seven heads and seven mountains are, are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth. There are five, seven kings, five are fallen, one is, another is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space, etc. That this must be drawing us back to the image of the beast. That it's going to draw us back to the United States. I would agree. Okay. Now, we know that Joseph Bates looked at this. And he said that the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition, he's going to tie this to the image of the beast. That is the image of the beast is the eighth and is of the seven because he believes the seven are the seven forms of Roman government. One of them is Republican. And so he's gonna say that this eighth is going to be of the seven. And so the eighth is not the woman riding the beast, which is the papacy here. So we have this woman riding the beast, committing fornication with this beast. And we know that that's the papacy. And the beast is going to be the civil power, the governments of the world, the different forms of government of Rome, right, that the woman has ridden. Right, and it's going to be the faith. The, the papal form of government, one of the heads is going to be the papal form of government. But it's the woman, the church, that is riding this beast. And then we're going to have this riddle. And this riddle is asking us and drawing us back to Revelation 13 to the 666. But now it's going to give us another illustration of this. It's going to talk about the time in which this is going to occur, in which this prophecy is going to be fulfilled regarding the mark of the beast. And it's telling us who's going to do that. And the same power is going to be the United States. That is the one that makes the image to the beast has to be the eighth. The papacy can't be the eighth. Because this is not talking about the, the papacies. Has the papacy's deadly wound been healed? Because we often took the position that its, its wound is healed when the Sunday law comes. But when we look at its wound, what was the wound that the papacy received in 1798? To its temporal power. Okay. Does it have temporal power? No. You don't think so? Well, not in, not in the manner that it used to have. Okay. okay. Not in the manner that it used to have, but it does have power. Was the papacy involved in taking down the Soviet Union? Yeah. 
Yes, it's still very active. Yeah, and it and and the United States provided the army, just like France did in the past. It provided the army for the papacy. We would have to agree with that because that's what happened historically. So the papacy, and in some ways, it doesn't have its its own army. I mean, it they got a few soldiers guarding the more ceremonial than anything guarding the Vatican, but but it uses the armies of the world. It did that during the time of the twelve hundred sixty years, and and it's been doing it once. Once it received that deadly wound, that deadly wound had been healed. But what we often look at is we say, well, one of the heads was wounded unto death and that it's going to receive, it's going to be healed. And when it's healed, it's going to be the eighth head. That's the argument we've made. And, and we're going to look at this more in more detail as well as we go through these studies. But one of the things I would argue, so even though I'm making this argument, I believe that the pioneers were correct. I do believe that we can apply this riddle to people. That is, I think we can look at the seven kings as being symbolic of, of kings, literal kings in the past and in the present. That is, we can apply this to the United States. So, so we're going to see why that is. So even though I'm saying all this that the pioneers were correct, I'm not, I'm not saying that we can't make an application similar to what Colin is doing. I think he's correct. And you'll see why that is, because we're going we're gonna to come back to his study again, and we're going to see why Colin is primarily correct in what he's saying. But that he's missing something. Because when you look at the eighth as being the papacy, you fail to understand what the Millerites were saying. And that light then is being ignored and we can't ignore it. And it can help us to understand how we apply this riddle in different ways. That is, we can apply this riddle in the past and in the present. So can I ask you a question? Yeah. So how do you what, how do you place the work of the Jesuits with respect to the Catholic Church? Okay. Well, well, the do Jesuits. You that or, okay. Explain your question more. So we know the Jesuits include, is yeah. Do you include the Jesuits in the Catholic Church, the work that they've been doing, or? Do you think that they are totally separate and a different entity almost? <sighs> I see them as part of the Catholic Church, but they also have their own goals and aims that don't necessarily or usually or not always align with the Pope. But now we have a Jesuit Pope. And one of the things about the Jesuits, so I grew up in the 1970s primarily, and my dad was a believer in um, the Jesuits. So my dad was United Church minister, but he really liked the Jesuits and he liked them because of um, the, what was it called? Uh, I can't think of the word for it. Um, the social programs of the Jesuits. What's, what's the word for that? The work they were doing in Central America and uh, anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, I wouldn't call it so good work though, but in yeah, the surface, but, some of it looked like it was probably good, but. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of communistic. Uh, yeah, very much so. And what was the they word? Had, they had their work. Red, reductionis or reductions, the Jesuit reduction, the liberation theology. And yeah, liberation theology. theology. I want to bring right. it here. Yeah, my yeah. mother was really into that. Yeah, and my, my dad was into it, he's into the ecumenical movement, um, you know, so he, he, but that, you know, that was something that was very stylish or fashionable 
back in the 60s and 70s, especially after Vatican II, you know, in the 60s. Um, so, you know, this idea of liberation theology and that we're going to make the world a better place and so forth. Well, this is really communism. So when we got this Jesuit Pope, Francis, I mean, you can definitely see he's a leftist, much more even, even though the Catholic Church has really always been on the left economically, uh, but he's also socially a leftist. So, you know, we saw, of course, Parminder and Tess going off in that direction as well. Um, well the so, reason I asked that question. Yeah. Sorry. Um, the reason I asked that question. Mark, uh, Chris is talking. Look, I uh, take off. Oh, yeah. I will do your prayers and comments too. Same time, different days. I'm okay. so still happy. I got this right now. I'm okay, here. Mark. Chris is sorry, talking. Sorry, sorry, be rude. Okay, okay, Chris, go on. Okay, don't try to make the curse and rosary. Angela, say again. Didn't help, but every time I see a rosary, it all, I almost barf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well. The only reason I asked that question about your understanding and, and uh, how you put the Jesuits with respect to the church is because, yeah, to me, they are both doing this, working out the same efforts. So, uh, and if we don't include them, we're, we're really being blind. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely the Jesuits, they, uh, you could almost say they've inf infiltrated the Catholic church, if you want to put it that way. Um, because Ignatius, St. Ignatius of Loyola, or whatever you, however you want to look at him, um, his whole philosophy was, I mean, very, very, um, um, far seen. The whole goal of where the Catholic Church has been moving has been driven there by the Jesuits. Now, there's other forces and powers within the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church is quite diverse. But it's really the Jesuits who have finally gotten control of the Catholic Church here at the end of the world. And it's their goals that really are, are the ones we, um, are the ones that are going to bring about those end time events. That's my understanding of it. But the thing is, it's much more liberal than than we imagined, because what we always imagined when we did our study examining the foundation, and we look at what Adventists in the 1990s were saying, Jeff was saying, is we're looking for this very conservative, evangelical movement to unite with the papacy under this conservative type of control to bring about this religious law of Sunday but we can see that the world has changed and that what's coming about is something that's much more progressive, much more liberal. That the churches in the United States, the things they hold in common are not conservative views, but are very liberal views. And, and it's hard for us to sometimes know it because we're not part of this Christian world, but evangelicals that I know are extremely immoral sexually. Um, they, they are not conservatives by any stretch of the imagination. There are some conservative evangelicals, but those are few and far between in, in the big scheme of things. So, so the world has really changed and, and the Catholic Church is going in the direction of the world because it's actually created the direction that the world is going. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So the world, what we see happening today in the world has come from the Jesuits. It's come from the Catholic Church. The world thinks that it's, it's controlling itself. But really, all of these philosophies, these communistic philosophies, these all come from the Jesuits. 
you know, there's a much bigger story there than, like you said, than the conservative view that we used to have. Yeah, exactly. So, so anyway, there's, there's still, you know, a lot we're going to have to study on this. But the main point that I wanted to bring up before you asked your question is that I think that we can reconcile all of the things that we are studying if we go back to the past and understand the past and allow God to reveal this light to us as he wants to reveal it to us based upon the past, not based upon looking at the headlines and trying to interpret, you know, the war with Russia and Ukraine, how does that fit in? You know, we don't want to be reactionary to everything that's happening around us and think we know what's happening because we have Bible prophecy that we need to understand. And, you know, as I've said before, I think it's a mistake to think that Trump is going to get reelected and that that's somehow going to vindicate this movement. Even if he was reelected, even if he came to power again, this wouldn't vindicate this movement because everyone, all kinds of people I know, believe that Trump's going to come to power again. If we're saying it, we're not saying anything different than anyone else is saying. It wouldn't, nobody would care that we also said it. And why would we need to, come, to be vindicated anyway? Well, oh, that's the other thing. yeah, no, what God's calling us to is something quite different. Yeah, Mark. Um, I heard when I heard find you saying about Donald Trump as a, a killing dog. Is a neighbor with USA not loud vote Donald Trump be government again all all of Canada came up with USA vote Bob still government against Donald Trump. Okay, thanks. I so like him. Okay, thanks, Mark. Okay, so um, so we need to finish our study here this this evening, but we're going to come back to this um, next Friday, and um, there's a lot of things we still have to study. As far as I can see, um, our study here is going to be a couple of months at least till we finally come around uh, to really address all of these points. Um, because we're going to have to look at uh, some of the past studies as well. So hopefully that was helpful. I know that there is still a lot of loose ends in people's minds, and I, and I don't like leaving loose ends, but we can't tie it all up uh, today. The, the only thing I do want to say again, reiterate this, is that I do believe that we can reconcile these different views. I don't think it's this sort of mutually exclusive ideas that I need to believe this. And if I believe this, I can't believe that. To me, they are, they come together. All of these different studies will come together and we'll see that this is, is giving us a very clear picture of what's happening now and what's going to happen in the future. And that we need to have that understanding if we're going to give a message. So any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the Sabbath. We ask for your presence through the Sabbath hours that we can... Um, fellowship with you and that our contact with others will be to your glory. Forgive us for our sins and help us to trust in you. Help us to study your word diligently. Be with us in Dwight's study tomorrow morning and in um, any study that we participate in. Uh, thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>